All right, welcome back. Can you hear me? Oh, it's following me. Oh, now I understand how annoying this thing is. And this just went down. Okay. All right. It's back. This was made so that uh, to attract your attention. There's something I would like to uh, you to notice before starting the class. There's at least one person here who is a bit, and I think he's not here, but to appreciate what it means. Oh, you're here. Yeah. This is, this is exactly, this is the second most sacred day in Italy after Christmas. Well, the first after Christmas. It's the most important holiday. And I think this is already the second time I'm teaching on this page, so I'm, uh, I've been receiving greetings today from my friends. Oh, where are you at the beach? How are you celebrating? And oh, I'm here teaching with a bunch of wonderful students. Okay. So... We're all tired, let's take this uh, slowly, also because the subject doesn't really belong to the school in the extent that what I was requested in the organization of the school, what I thought about teaching is so-called indirect searches for dark matter that I'm sure some of you have heard about, some of you work on, and there has been references to them in the during the other classes, Johannes, uh, Kota, even Blasi and Serpico at some point pointed to indirect searches of dark matter. This is something that you will find, especially if you keep working in high energy astrophysics, you will keep finding and popping up, okay? I shall say right now, and I will say at the end to tomorrow, that I would not recommend to base your career on indirect searches of dark matter. One of my students is present here, and when she joined the group, I said, look, I'm very happy if you come with us, but I wouldn't base your career on that not at this stage, maybe 10 years ago it could have been a good idea. But it's certainly something that you need to know how it works, okay? So rather than giving you a, a detailed class on how to do it and the exact details of what to do, which if you're already working on, you can come and ask me and suggestions and things, I will try and give an overview, since this is a school, of how it comes that we look for dark matter with high energy astrophysics. Because after all, since we call it dark, matter, it doesn't make any sense at all with, that we're looking at it with either photons of high energy, charged cosmic rays of high energy, or whatever else, because it's dark matter, okay? So there is a rationale on why we look for it, or at some types of dark matter with high energy astrophysics, and that's why it's sitting in the school, and I will get to it probably at the end of this class, I'll start talking about why that comes, and tomorrow I will get into some details. So today I will give you a review of what is dark matter. How many of you think they know what is dark matter? No, I'm not going to ask you the question what it is. <laughs> if you think you know what it is, raise your hand. That's good because I have no freaking clue. <laughs> I've been working on it for 10 years and I have absolutely no clue what dark matter is, but I take it that you've taken the question like you know where it comes about, okay? Why we talk about dark matter. So if I, how many of you are convinced that if I asked you what are the prime reasons why we talk about dark matter, how many of you are convinced that they know the answer? I'm, I'm not gonna ask you what do you think it is. Okay, so there's like five people that are convinced they know what the answer is. That probably means that probably two of them maybe know the real answer. So this class is well posed. So this class seemingly has nothing to do with the subject of the school, but I think it's, it's good to review what this is about. So why we talk about dark matter at all? You probably have seen this plot before. You've seen it in Carlos' slides. Maybe some of you noticed that in Carlos' slides, at the bottom of this plot, there, there was something read, writing like today. I paid attention to it. And I'm putting z equals zero. Z is obviously the redshift, okay? 
So the energy budget, the energy density budget of the universe today, you've heard it, you probably read it from the news, it's a certain, it's major, almost 70% of something we have no freaking idea what it is, dark energy, that pushes the universe to accelerate their expansion. And then there is something close to 30%, which is dark matter, and then there is something that's ordinary matter, which is whatever we believe is in the standard model, okay? Now, I will, you know this, but uh, I will argue that probably this information is absolutely worthless, presented as it is, okay? So this is within the paradigm of lambda called dark matter, so a cosmological scenario in which we are dominated by lambda, the dark energy, whatever makes the universe accelerate in its expansion, and a component of matter that we have no idea of what it is, that it doesn't interact with anything electromagnetic at least. So rather than presenting you this scenario and the scenario that you probably know of the lambda called dark matter in which you start from small fluctuations, these fluctuations with time grow because the universe expands, they collapse, they form structures, they form galaxies, they form potential wells, and within these potential wells the galaxies form. I think that presenting this paradigm is very useful if you want to have a generic knowledge, but understanding where the problem comes about in physics is extremely important, okay? So all this scenario is actually what we have in mind today. This is what we see. But as a matter of fact, the setback for this scenario, what is at the basis of this scenario, comes from completely different types of observation. We don't build, we don't build this top down. We build it bottom up. Okay, and so the evidence for something for a dark component of matter, and that's very well posed name, because as I will show you, it's dark, it, does, it means it does not interact with the light, that basically means electromagnetically, and it is matter, so it interacts gravitationally, it's well posed. We have observation that evades, so don't look at this plot here, it evades cosmological proofs. It's just based at the very beginning of facts on astrophysical and astronomical probes. Most of them local galaxies around us, okay? Then I will argue at some point that they do not convince you of all the facts. They, they give you only some part of the information, but the information about the fact that there is this dark component of matter, and it's actually extremely important in our understanding of the universe, comes from a host of things put together, okay? And I will come to that. There will be one additional step. The dark component of matter is not necessarily something strange, okay? And during the class, I will try and make the point that historically, can you hear me? Is this microphoning? Historically, people have thought about absolutely mundane or conventional explanations for this dark component of matter. There is a reason an historical reason and a scientific reason why today we do not believe that any mundane, trivial explanation is possible. And we believe that you have to expand the standard model of, of particle physics. So you have to go beyond that. But again, let me stress the point that I will not break the standard model of particle physics. It's having an astronomical and astrophysical problem like the dark matter doesn't mean that the standard model is not working. It's just that it's incomplete like Newton's law is perfectly working on some scales, but it's an incomplete theory of gravity, okay? Now, let me get to think, understanding the evidence for dark matter is luckily enough something that one can do with relatively simple mathematics and astronomy, and of course you have to understand the data and how it works, but in formal terms that's easy, okay? So the first proposal of, historically, of the, um, missing mass in a system is not in the rotation curve of the galaxies that you probably have heard about, you know, but it comes from clusters. However, the world had different problems to cope with in 33, like uh, the raising of nationalisms, xenophobia, uh, separation of uh, income and wealth, something very much resembling what's going on today. But, so people were worried about other things, and on the top of it, I don't know this firsthand, of course, but the person that presented this problem in the first place was someone that wasn't very sympathetic, who was known for being a troublemaker or not such a nice person, at least in personal terms. So when he identified a problem, and now I will explain you what this problem is, people either ignored it or they looked somewhere else. So you, you know what a cluster of galaxies is. 
what is a cluster of galaxies? Huh? It's galaxies clustering together, which is <laughs> sort of tautological, right? It's not just some galaxies sitting in the same region or volume of the space. It's galaxies that belong to each other, that have a collective motion. As a matter of fact, and I'm not going to tell you how you can do it, but you have to prove that they belong to the same gravitational structure. Otherwise, it's just objects that are sitting there in the same field of view and wouldn't make sense. Okay? But provided that we can convince ourselves, and this was one of the problems with the clusters, that these galaxies are actually sharing the host environment, at least gravitationally, then you would expect that since galaxies in a galaxy cluster are basically collisionless particles, okay? Um, am I making sense when I say these things? So collisionless and collisional was used by Blasi during this class and Serpico. If I have a galaxy cluster which is 100 megaparsec, which is a very big volume, and I put in things, the galaxies of the scale of 10 kiloparsec, okay? They interact only gravitationally within each other. If I tell you the mass, you can compute the interaction radius, and you realize that the chance of two galaxies within this volume to interact, basically on the equivalent of, an, on a, of a Van der Waals force or something like that, it's very small. So as a matter of fact, practically, the galaxies within a cluster are col a collisionless system, right? Because it's per a perfect gas that just presents the gravitational potential of whatever is making the cluster, okay? So in a way, if I go to the clusters, I have plenty of galaxies that belong together. And of course, since we already know where we want to go, my game is that I look at the total mass. Right? So how can I weigh the total mass of a cluster? I want to estimate the total mass of a cluster. How do I do it? Mm -hmm. The virial theorem. Exactly. So basically, it does, as I'm, I was saying, they are, they are a gas, collisionless gas. I can apply the virial theorem. Okay, the virial theorem tells you that the kinetic energy is basically the temperature which is basically the force acting on the potential energy acting on the system. Therefore, if I measure the kinetic energy of the particles, I can measure the total gravitational potential. Okay? That's simple. Now, how do I, as we said, the galaxies are a gas. So measuring the kinetic energy me means measuring the velocity, the mean velocity or whatever I want to attach to these galaxies, which in principle I can do through spectroscopy. Okay? So a first measurement of the total observed mass of the clusters is through virial theorem. Okay. Now, of course, again, my problem is that I want to compare it to the observed mass, the visible mass. And that's simple, right? Because what do I do? I take the galaxies, I look at the photometry, I know how to integrate the stellar population, how know, I know the color magnitude relationship, so I can estimate the mass of a galaxy based on astrophysics that I want to know. Okay? So I get photometry somehow of the galaxies. All right. There is a mismatch of a factor approximately 10, which is not the same mismatch that I was showing you in the first plot. Okay, but now, so there is a mismatch of a factor approximately 10 between the visible mass and this. This is typically bigger than this one, okay? Just to make sure that we understand. So the total measured mass, which I measure, so the gravitational mass, is much bigger than the visible mass. Now, of course, you can say, well, I am not weighing, the galaxies are not the only thing. Fair enough. What is inside a cluster beside galaxies, since I just see galaxies? which I look in photometry, which I look mostly in the optical. So there is something else, and that's the gas, which I don't have here. Yes. Okay? So in fact, it turns out that most of the mass in the cluster, most of the visible mass in the cluster is made of gas, 
And since the cluster is extremely massive, we're talking about 10 to the 15, so 14, 15 solar masses, the temperatures are very high, so the gas gets heated that it emits in the X-ray, okay? So, okay, I take the photometer of the galaxies that doesn't match the visible mass, fair enough, because I know that's not most of the visible mass, although it's visible in another frequency in the X-rays, but I see it, so I go to the X-rays. Gas. And as a matter of fact, this is way bigger than the mass of the galaxies, but it's still smaller than the total mass measured with the virial theorem, by a factor of five approximately. Okay, so how do I solve this? Because now I'm really considering everything that I know visible in the cluster. Okay. Well, you might still say, I don't believe your virial theorem. Okay. Because the system is not relaxed, because it doesn't apply for a host of reasons, you might say it doesn't really. So, one thing, of course, once I have the gas inside, I can do a lot of fancy things like basically, by the gas temperature, estimate the total mass again by the gas temperature itself, just by applying the force and the uh, equation of state. Okay, so again, I might even use the gas to estimate independently the mass of the cluster, but I don't want to do it because I want to have two completely different set of observables so I know that I'm not intersecting systematics or things like that. Well, how can I measure mass today? Now, we're not in the 1930s anymore. Lensing, very well. So you use lensing, as a matter of fact, and the lensing is extremely good because the lensing is really sensitive to everything that it's inside, like the virial theorem, but that you have under control. The virial theorem, you have to make assumptions. So in fact, clusters are beautiful lensing objects and you can use the background galaxies as a lensed image and then you recon can reconstruct the mass that you see along the line of sight, which is typically that of your own cluster. Okay, the cluster that you have done. And so as a matter of fact, sorry, you can actually substitute the virial theorem with weak lensing, mostly is weak lensing. You have estimates which are compatible, as so that, that was well posed, and the problem remains. You have a factor of five typically integrated, because of course the distribution is another thing, the mismatch. Now we're talking about clusters, which means a physical scale of the size is one to 10 megaparsecs and the mass is 10 to the 14 or 15 solar masses typically. Okay, keep this in mind. Now, so I have one set of information that is coming from the cluster and that's very interesting because I can reconstruct all the gravitational constraints, etc. Now. Let's move to the fact that sometimes separately, okay, I take a lot of individual clusters and that happens. I don't know why I stuck things probably in the way I have, but uh, I will follow this. So one other thing that happens is that sometimes clusters collide with each other, okay? And galaxies are mostly unaffected. Why is that? because it's a collisionless system, right? So if I throw two collisionless list systems one against the other, the galaxies are unaffected. And there will be some galaxy-galaxy hit. It's possible, they get disrupted, but mostly the statistical system won't be modified. So the galaxies go through each other, right? So if you manage to identify a system in which there is a, a cluster which is consistently moving, the galaxies are consistently moving in a certain direction and the other in, in, in the other direction on the other side, you are identifying a merger of galaxies, a cluster merger, okay? So the interesting thing is that actually when I was young, so 2006, there was these amazing observations in which people did identify a system through a, a, a cluster merger in which you could identify the galaxies, you could see the X-rays of the gas, and you could see the gravitational lensing for bo both clusters, okay? And there was something that was called at the time the bullet cluster. I don't know if you heard about it, okay? And the bullet cluster is a system in which you know that this bunch of galaxies is moving leftward, you know that this bunch of galaxies is moving rightward, 
Mm -hmm. And this is the gas that belong to the clusters. Now, when two clusters merge, as I said, the galaxies go through, but the gas, what does it do? The gas is sensible to the friction with itself. It's Thomson scattering, basically. So to a certain extent, the gas, depending on the velocity that it has originally, but it will interact with itself, it will heat up even more, and it, will, there, it feels an effective friction, so it will tend to be a little bit more concentrated in, toward the center. It will be slowed down, okay? And in fact, in the, in the bullet cluster, what you see is that whereas the, the galaxies are mostly separated, the gas is separated, but it tends to stay in the middle, okay? And you can see here even the shockwave. That's why it's called a bullet, because this thing has the shape of a bullet. That's the shockwave of the gas. Now, the amazing thing is that I can look at the gravitational lensing of each individual cluster, okay? And I find that, let's not look at the gas for the moment, I just look at the galaxies, and the galaxies, they're moving, but okay. And then I reconstruct the clusters and the lensing of the cluster, and I find here that most of the mass in each of the cluster is overlapping with the galaxies. And again, it's not adding up to the mass exactly like it was happening with the individual. So the mass is it's the same ratio, it's the same problem. And, the ga and, the, and the, where most of the mass is, so where the lensing is telling with the Ries mass, it's together with the galaxies, and again, it doesn't match the gas. Now, the gas got stuck in the middle. The galaxies went through. So whatever is making this mismatched mass, whatever is this dark matter, and I'm not saying what it is, if it's clustering with, if it's staying with the galaxies, but it's not the galaxies, what sort of property does it have to have? Collisionless, okay? So this is the interesting thing, that from, from the clusters as systems, you can derive the information that there is a missing mass, that it does not interact with the light, and on the top of it, you can put some constraints on its interaction both with the gas and with itself. Because if it only interacted with itself, it would get stuck in the middle. And interacted with itself at the level of the gas or sphere, it would get stuck in the middle. So basically, from this system, you have X systems and limits on its self-collisionality. Self meaning both with the gas on interaction. Okay, are we good with that? Now, as I'm saying, I'm saying it's limits. I'm not saying it's completely collisionless because I cannot prove it. It has, I'm just putting a constraint on how collisional it can be. So this will, I mean, I'm stressing this point because I will get there to the point that maybe it can interact weakly when I have a particle model. So what I'm trying to say is whenever you hear people saying, well, but dark matter can be something interacting weakly, as long as it doesn't violate this bound, you can have a micro scale interaction. It just doesn't have to violate this bound, which is actually quite well constrained because you don't only have the, the bullet cluster. So this is the view of the gravitational lensing and the gas in, in between. Okay, and you can see here that, it, that the gravitational lensing is clustered with the galaxies, which are not clustered with the gas. But then you actually have a plethora of system I, I don't know how many, but in this reference, which is already historical, you can find whole very detailed studies on, on, um, on many of these systems. And as a matter of fact, you can put, as they do here, a constraint on the self-interactivity of, of the dark matter. So this already is pointing into the direction that it must be something extremely bizarre, right? Again, it, you can still postulate, and people have done it, that it might be something not like the gas, but mini planetoids or rocks or something like that, which still constrain, respect somehow the, bind, the bound of the non-collisionality. It would be very bizarre, but you could do it. Something like primordial black holes that collapsed into something very tiny and very diffuse, and it doesn't interact with each other. 
But so we have one system, that's fine. Of course, I went back and forth from history because it started in 33, but then the final proofs that I'm showing are something like from a few years ago. But then let's go to the, uh, to the more known systems like uh, the rotation curves of the galaxies. Uh, first of all, they have to be disk galaxies, right? Are you positive with that? Because a, a disk galaxy is rotation supported. So maybe you don't know what a rotation curve is, right? Okay, so probably let me get to that. You, when you have something like a disk galaxy, which is gonna look like this from one side, but it's gonna look like this from the other side, you tend to believe, and you have very good reasons, theoretical and in terms of uh, um, physical explanation, that whenever is in the disk is in, uh, it's, it's in balance with the gravitational force, so it's rotation supported. This is actually something that you can do by hand, although it's not that trivial. Imagining that a, a gas, a cloud of gas, spherical um, cloud of gas collapses, okay? Losing energy, but not angular momentum. The most stable configuration is a disk, because you, you can see that. I mean, proving it is non-trivial. So if I am measuring at each point in the radius the tangential velocity, obviously I'm measuring the gravitational force inside, if this holds true, if this balance between the two, between the gravitational force and the, and the circular motion holds true. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that this thing is obviously non, not flat, not a disk, it's not, it's not a solid disk, it's rotating at different speeds, but the most important thing is that if I find a tracer which is outside the disk by far, what I would expect to measure is something that falls entirely, right? Because most of the mass that I expect to be there is in the stars, and if it's far away from the stars, I would expect the rotation curve to go down, right? Because the rotation curve is tracing Tracing the gravitational force, which goes like one over r square. Okay, good. All right, this is very trivial, but uh, as you probably know, when people started measuring these things, they found out that the rotation curve, so basically a proxy for measuring the total gravitational force, was sort of flat and extending beyond the disk of stars. Now, you might be wondering if there are no stars, how am I measuring the stuff in the disk? You can find appropriate tracers, masers, and stuff that is in a disk structure, although very much rarefied, okay? So let me mention one thing. Now I'm using disk galaxies. Which are systems with masses much smaller than those of the galaxy clusters, obviously, and, uh, and a physical scale which is of the order of 10 to 40 kiloparsec, okay? But then again, if I measure the, I, the total observed mass, I use the rotation curve, and I use the photometer of stars, of individual stars, to estimate the total, the, the visible mass of the Milky Way, bizarrely enough, I find the same ratio that I was finding here, okay? But it's a completely different physical scale, okay? And it's also a completely different system. The physics of this, distant, this system is different. And on the top of it, the techniques that I'm using are different, okay? So by itself, this should sort of, uh, give a hint that is not really a systematic problem. And, uh, but at this point, I'm still constrained by the fact that I don't really know what this stuff is. And in fact, what people supposed for a long time was that you had micro objects, like the ones that could be solving the, uh, the cluster, it would be collisionless, and they're scattered around the galaxy. So you have a halo of these planetoids, dark things, this because in the galaxy the gas doesn't really act, it's not, it's not really prominent. The point is that you can actually constrain, okay, so this is a little bit what you find, let me get back to that. You can actually constrain this object, the mass of these small objects by you looking at the microlensing. So if 
whatever makes a dark matter, and I will come to why, how we know how it is distributed, is made up of these very small objects, you should see microlensing events. You know what a microlensing is? Microlens? No? Okay, so microlens is a lens in which the, um, the size, okay, so here you have the, the here you have the uh, source, and here you have an intervening object, which is a lens which is moving. Okay? When this object is very compact, the either the distortion that it causes in terms of the lens or the multiple image, they are collapsed for, for the observer in the same point like source. Okay? So what happens if I put multiple images on one thing on the same pixel, on the same source? is that if this is the luminosity, the intensity, and this is time, the lens is here, it doesn't cause any lens, so this is the original intensity of the thing, and as the object goes in front of it, it had, there are multiple images of the object collapsing on itself, so you will see a bip. This is microlensing. And as a matter of fact, it's a very uh, powerful technique. So one way to tell, look, in our galaxy, whatever is making this dark matter halo is not planetoids, is because they would overshoot the microlensing that you see toward the other objects, because the, the things should be in the halo around the galaxy. And the reason why we believe there is a halo is that actually there could be stuff distributed along the disk, but we also know how it's this distribution, because we see that the total observe rotation curve is flat, so it's a constant, and outside the disk, whatever is the mass of the stars is falling like Newton, like I'm expecting to do. So if I do the mismatch between the two, I can integrate back the density profile that I need, and it's something that has a certain density profile, and it extends beyond the disk, okay? So, from these simple, well, they're not very simple arguments, but there is a lot of observations going into these two systems, these several systems. We know that there is a missing component of matter. We know that we tend to believe it cannot be baryonic, it cannot be trivial, mundane explanation, like gas, it cannot be planetoids, although we're not certain about planetoids and stuff, okay? Sort of thing. But one thing that unfortunately uh, seemed to be still obsessing people is modified gravity, okay? So one thing that I like to do in these classes is to bring you up to this example, these two examples, and then enter into the CMB, which really depends on your mental modeling of the universe. But still, when you have two systems like this, now, believe me or not, but in principle, if you add only the galaxies, and the galaxies all behave one and like all, all the same, which they don't, but still in approximation, you could be thinking, okay, it's not, it's not uh, the matter that is missing, it's gravity that is misbehaving on a specific scale, okay? So without knowing the Lagrangian of this new gravity, I just invent something phenomenological that it works with general relativity, and it works with Newton, of course, and then it fixes the problem at the galaxy. It turns out that there is, and there's plenty of these theories, okay? They're called modifying Newtonian dynamics. And, they do not work very well with all the galaxies. You still have to choose a scale, but let's say that they do work. The point is that once you fix this stuff with modified dynamics, well, then you expect that this stuff fixes the entire problem. But then you go to the clusters and you don't manage to fix the clusters. And on the top of it, you don't manage to fix the separation problem, the gas with respect to most of the mass, because if it was just a matter of modifying the gravity, then what creates most of the mass is the gas. And the gas gets stuck in the middle. And you see that most of the lensing profile is, is where the galaxies are, okay? So there is a, a lot of things that tend to conspire toward the fact, actually, erase the word conspire, it's very the wrong one, point together to the fact that it's not really a modification of gravity. Okay, questions so far? Yes. One question. Um, in the 
gas is in the intergalactic region, really? Mm, the, or the, it's attached to the galaxies? The gas is not attached to the galaxies. So you, the cluster is a huge volume in which originally there was a lot of gas interspersed. And on the top of these big volumes, there, so this is a huge gravitational potential. And within this gravitational potential, there were smaller alteration of potential. These ones cause the galaxy. So the gas that was in here collapsed into the galaxy. And the gas that was in between the galaxies did not collapse to form galaxies. Okay. Okay. Because my, my question was related to the fact that if dark matter is in the halo of the, uh, galaxies and galaxies don't collide, why would I expect dark matter to collide and stay in the middle? I'm not expecting it. So far, I'm not expecting anything. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so far, I'm just deriving. That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. But but uh, so far, I'm not. You, you are already theorizing on what it could be and how it works, right? So far, I'm just telling you there is there are a lot of point-like objects, which are actually really point-like with respect to the size of the volume. Mm -hmm. And so they do not interact. I throw them one against the other. They go through each other. So whatever is in this small billiard ball doesn't feel the rest because it's compact in itself. And wherever is in between, there must be two components. Okay? There must be one component which is sort of self-interacting. It's the gas. We know it. Mm -hmm. And there is another component that is not self-interacting, and it's emitting most of the gravity. It's creating most of the gravity because I see it in the gravitational lensing. How it went there, I'm still not theorizing it, right? OK. At this stage, I didn't. OK. I, I will at some point, or you can ask me this question later on. But so far, I'm just okay. providing you empirical evidence. And that, that's a short circuit I'm trying to break. You already have things in mind. That's why I told you that on the second slide, this is, how we, this is what the image you have in mind. But let's wait how we built that image. Otherwise, you're always going to mix. Uh, how to say? Uh, conclusions and no hypothesis and opinions and facts. Have you seen that movie? The the Disney one. It's called Inside Out. That there are the three in the in the in the girl's mind, and then it's the night train and the, all the box. The, these two boxes get uh, get uh, shaken and the thing. Oh, it's facts and opinions. They got mixed. It happens all the time. Right? So don't mix facts and opinions. So that's 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 a good opinion. It's a it's a but it's a theoretical prejudice or it's something that you. But that ask me later on, okay? So where were we? So at this point, I'm just working with stuff that is relatively local, okay? Right? Now, okay. This was the thing about the how things are in balance with itself, and so how it looks. So you see this discrepancy outside. But the thing I would like to, of course, you can measure this discrepancy already inside the disk of stars. But to be convenient, you just go outside of the disk of stars, where it's obvious that you would have a discrepancy if the entire amount of mass was given by stars. Okay? And outside the disk of stars, you really see this discrepancy. Now, this is a 20 kiloparsec scale. Typically, the disk of a disk galaxy doesn't exceed 12, 15 kiloparsec at the most. In the case of our Milky Way, it's 10 kiloparsec. OK? And so this is what you see. Now, if you want to start theorizing on how dark matter got there and how you form a galaxy in the first place, this is a good moment. And uh, probably I said that at the, but imagine that you want to form a galaxy by the spherical collapse of two components. OK? I'm, I'm not in any cosmological thing. I'm just saying I have these two components. This is the big radius, so it is something like 30 kiloparsec, or 40, or something like that. And there is a component of collisionless stuff, and there is a, a component which is a factor of five smaller in mass. They, they, are, they have the same distribution at the beginning. It doesn't really matter, okay? Which is the gas. Now, they're bound, so they, the total mass is defining a gravitational potential in which these things are stuck. OK? So what happens to the gas? We know the gas. OK, let's say it's H2 molecules or H2 molecules, something. 
depending on the mass of the halo, they will be heated up to a virial temperature, okay? If the virial temperature is high enough, these things will start radiate. That, that's why, because they, they will hit each other, collide. Kinetic, kinetically, they will excite the, the modes of the molecules, and the energy, the original kinetic energy, will cascade down because it went into excitation, and then it will cascade down. And in fact, that's the way you form stars. And in fact, below certain virial masses, you don't form stars in a halo. Okay? So the gas will lose energy because it's collisional and because it's dissipational. And if it loses energy, where does it go? There's a potential well. This stuff is very excited. It's going around. It gets de-excited, I mean, kinetically, and it sinks to the bottom of the potential, right? At the same time, the component that cannot dissipate energy stays excited around. So I do expect naively, I'm not giving you the detail, but this is the way to think, I do expect naively that whatever is dissipational, that will sink toward the center. And this is what you see. You find that most of the stars are in toward the center, and there is a dynamical component, there is a component that is creating dynamics through gravity that is extended outside. So again, I was starting from the empirical evidence, now I'm trying to explain it somehow, but it's sort of the naive model seems to be working, okay? So, galaxies, clusters, different physics. Still, that doesn't prove me that I have to extend the standard model of particle physics, right? There is one thing that is the ultimate proof, and it's extremely complicated to show because you, I mean, I think we actually performed these computations about the CMB a few years ago, so I'm going to give you the flavor uh, of it. But you know that this is the CMB, right? It's um, density contrast that reflects into uh, the temperature contrast of the CMB. Is it clear why that's happening? Because at the moment of CMB formation, you have stuff that is oscillating in the gravitational potential wells, and so some are going down, some are going up, and so the ones that are coming toward us or up, they're losing energy, so it's a little bit colder, and the, one, and the ones that are otherwise are a little bit hotter. That's basically what you're seeing when you're looking at the CMB. By the way, this is obviously a 10 to the minus five for contrast. If you were looking at the CMB at zero order, you would see a flat thing. That's the point of, right? So the thing is that the actual CMB spectrum, um, no, I'll get to this later on. The actual CMB spectrum is giving you information on the total of the potential wells, on the distribution of the power on different scales, but it's also giving you information about the oscillation of stuff within the potential well, okay? Now, this is non-trivial, but if, you, if you're taking a CMB course, think about it and try to extract this information. The first two proofs are obviously more uh, visualizable. The CMB is not. But what's going on is that each of these different peaks or the ratio between the different peaks depend, from, depend on relatively simple physics. There is just gravitation and electromagnetic interactions, okay? But they're giving you information about one thing is the total gravitational potential well, that is telling you how deep and how to the bottom the stuff oscillates. And the other thing is the shear and the friction within the potential well that is slowing things down, okay? So there's two concurring information that enter in the CMB. And the ratio of these different peaks, of one peak or the ratio of the peaks, is giving you information about the two things separately. Now, again, naively, if I was expecting that total matter and whatever is creating friction, so electromagnetic friction or weak friction, whatever, are the same, I should find that the omega matter, so whatever creates the gravitational potential, and omega, I call it friction, and they are the baryons, okay, are the same. It turns out that they're not. And the way it turns out is that the model is extremely, the, the spectrum of the CMB is extremely dependent from these two parameters, okay, and as you can see, the, the measurements are extremely good and they identify very well the, the actual shape of the spectrum. And I find out that 
whatever causes the friction in here is smaller by a factor five of whatever causes the gravitational potential well. Now, this is a sort of the ultimate proof for the reason that at the time, at the CMB, there were not stars, there was not gas. So everything that was stable, so that's why we identified with the baryons, because it's the standard model stable at redshift 1000, which is already several thousands of years after the thermal phases of the Big Bang. Whatever was stuck in here, whatever material existed, was there. No stars, no gas, just hydrogen, okay, and a little bit of helium. So if it was something else, it's non-baryonic. Or it's some form of baryonicity very strange, like primordial black holes that do not participate in this process, okay? You will probably find some flavors of this using the CMB in its early stages just to measure the total gravitational potential, as it was the case when I was a student. It was not possible to measure the baryons within the CMB itself. And you measure the baryons with the primordial nucleosynthesis. I cannot get into detail with that, but probably if you're taking a cosmology course, you will find out that information about how many baryons, so how much normal gas there is, it also comes from the relative abundances of hydrogen and helium. That's a very precise bariometer. It agrees with the CMB on the baryons, and it mismatches with the total omega matter of the CMB. Okay, so in a way, that's the ultimate proof that you need a non-baryonic component of matter, okay? So this is something, after this, I will go to other properties, and I will go to start postulating things and what sort of dark matter it can be and how we can look for it. But one thing that I would like you to realize at this stage is that there is no way to modify gravity and obtain this, okay? And in fact, when people tell you it's now there is this sort of fashion to say, well, we're not finding anything in accelerators, we're not finding anything here and there, so the dark matter, the paradigm is not safe, is not sound. It's completely incorrect. The paradigm of the existence of a dark component of matter comes from a host of probes, some of whom of which are actually local. The CMB and the BBN, which are within the context of a cosmological model, are additional proofs. Okay, we still have a problem. Now, let's say that you're sort of uh, really obsessed with wanting to modify gravity and to say, okay, but I wanna modify gravity and see if I can, things fit, okay? They don't fit galaxy and clusters, but let's say you wanna try and reproduce the CMB only. You know what these things are? That's the matter power spectrum, okay? So that's uh, actually, that's uh, the, de sorry, this is the density contrast, evolution is the time. So you find that the typical density contrast of the universe increases because the original fluctuations in the CMB, these original fluctuations in the CMB, they actually evolved. They did, each one of them followed the Hubble flow only up to a point and they started collapsing, okay? So the, the average density contrast of the universe typically increased, okay? That's the cold dark matter. What happens with the baryons is baryon acoustic oscillations. So if you've taken the cosmology course, that's also something that you might wanna look at. And baryons and the photons are actually stuck together. They oscillate, and that's what creates these sort of ripples up to the point in which baryons and photons separate around the CMB. So a power spectrum that it comes out of the baryons has necessarily this shape. Okay, this bumpy shape that comes from the coupling between photons and the baryons. And on the top of it, we know, well, now we know the power spectrum in a way, and we also know the density contrast at the CMB. So it's two different things. Now, let's not think about the shape for the moment. Let's just think about the fact that you have a density contrast of 10 to the minus 4 at shift 1000. You cannot evolve it into galaxies today unless you have a dark component of matter. The baryons alone are not enough to self-collapse themselves to form the galaxies, okay? But then you say, I invent a certain type of gravity, which at some point had some specific flavor in tensor vector scalar theories, and I manage to enhance the baryons themselves alone up to the point that they reach the enough density contrast to create the galaxies. 
You can do it in certain scenarios, but what happens is that you cannot avoid this bumpy shape which is given by the baryon acoustic oscillation. So as a matter of fact, they might reach the observed level of density contrast, but you cannot avoid this bumpiness of the spectrum. So again, even if you're trying to force things, you don't really manage to get something that fits the scenario, okay? Now, at this point, I have a picture of completely different scales. Incidentally, I think the scale of the oscillations in the same is something like 100 megaparsec, but Martin will correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so I have completely different observables that point to a dark component of matter, and that's well posed because it's, you don't see it and it exerts gravity, that it cannot be baryonic, all right? And, and it cannot be self-interacting to a certain extent. That's the collisionality, the, that, that's where the things start. Okay, at this point, and only at this point, I start wondering what it can be and how to ex uh, ex uh, extend the standard model. Okay, everything clear so far? Good. Does anybody want to ask something? Karim. For the modified gravity section, is this a model-dependent statement that you're making? Yes, it's a model-dependent statement. The model-independent statement is that I cannot find any that works. But the model, sorry, which statement? The statement that we cannot modify gravity and explain, for example, CMB constraints, something like this. No, there is no model that of my knowledge that can but actually. This is a model-independent yes. statement. The, okay. the, 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 the rough statement is model-independent. Awesome, thank you. Okay, good. At this moment, I can start postulating things and say, okay, look, what, what do I like and go beyond the standard model of particle physics, okay? Um, how many of you have heard about the WIMP miracle? But you, you never, you heard about the WIMP miracle and you never heard about this stuff. That's crazy, I mean, that's not, not because of you, I mean, it's, uh, but you, does anybody of you know what the WIMP miracle is, besides having heard about it? How many of you have taken cosmology? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let me get to one more property of the dark matter, just phenomenological, okay? Two more properties. This stuff is at which redshift? Clusters. Give it or take it, and <laughs> it also depends on the cluster, but no, 0 0.5, 1, no, I don't think you can form clusters. Yeah, you can form clusters at redshift 2. Uh, clusters form very late, which is actually gonna go in the direction of the next point. Um, 0 0.5, maybe 1, okay? Galaxies, these galaxies, the ones that I use for this, Zero, 0 0.01, the Milky Way is redshift zero, okay. Uh, you can observe it also in the Milky Way. CMB is at redshift 1,000, okay. CMB is at redshift 1,000, that's easy. So, and I still find the same contrast, still find the same problem. So if it is one particle that is creating, or a set of particles, it has to be there at the CMB, and it has to be there here today. So it has to be one more property is that now I believe that I want to extend the standard model of particle physics, whatever particle I have, to be the dark matter, the, the solution to the astrophysical problem, it has to be a stable particle. Paradoxically, I might be extending the standard model of particle theory and not getting a dark matter. If your extension doesn't have a stable particle, 
I mean, maybe that, that may be a good thing for a theorist, but you are not solving the astrophysical problem, okay? Is that clear, the difference between the two things? So, one thing, if I am set on the mindset to extend the standard value of, part of uh, particle physics in order to obtain a dark matter, it has to have a stable, at least one stable candidate, okay? It has to respect the property of non-collisionality, and it has to respect another thing which comes from structure formation. You heard about cold or hot dark matter, right? What does it mean? Yeah, but why is that? Why you want them non-relativistic? It has to be bound to galaxies. Does it make sense to you? And, if, and actually, you go to something even stronger than that. Clearly, if something is relativistic, it's not bound to any galaxy. Right? But there is a degree, I mean, not even to a cluster, but there is a degree. So basically, that's the mass of an object, not necessarily a galaxy, something, okay, an, an astrophysical object. And the more massive the object, the more can a particle be relativistic or close to relativistic in order to be bound to it. How do I compute it? Clearly, every mass will have a corresponding escape velocity, which depends on the mass. And the gravitational force acting on the particle will be something that depends also on the mass of the particle, right? So for each mass, so the V over mass of every, of, okay. I'm setting in the wrong way. If I want something to be bound to a galaxy, is index beta has to be increasingly small with the decreasing mass of the object, right? The smaller the gravitational potential, the smaller has to be the kinetic velocity of this object. That is, okay? Otherwise, it's not bound. So going to relativistic is already an excess. I mean, that's, that's the extreme. But basically, I want the beta well, no, I want that V over M to be small. Small is an arbitrary thing, okay? And how small, it depends on this. So this is the gravitational potential of galaxy clusters. This is the gravitational potential of elliptical or disk galaxies. This is the gravitational potential of dwarf galaxies. This is of uh, H1 systems. Uh, Non-forming stuff, non-dark gas objects. Okay, so now the thing is, How do I want it? Uh, beta, the relativistic index, okay? So something very relativistic, something very relativistic will only be bound to galaxies and clusters. Something mildly relativistic will only be bound to dwarf and disk galaxies and so on and so forth. So the less relativistic this dark matter is, consider that dark matter is actually forming the gravitational potential. So it's not that it's, you want it to be bound to galaxies. You want it to be able to sit in its own gravitational potential. So these are not really the gravitational potential wells of the galaxies. These are the density contrasts that either are dissolved by their own velocity dispersion or not, okay? And we do observe dwarf galaxies. So this, this is the scale of dwarf galaxies. And we do observe H1 systems, okay? So where beta is very, very high, we will call it hot. Where beta is very, very low, we call it cold. And it has to be enough cold to form the objects that we see. That's the reason why standard model neutrinos cannot be the dark matter in the first place. 
my father has not called me in two weeks and he does it now. Papà, scusa, sto facendo lezione, ti chiamo dopo. Ciao. <laughs> he really didn't call me more than two weeks. But, um, so, um, what was I saying? I got touched by my father's call. What is the smallest scale of computation? This is, a, this is the next slide. Thank you very much for reminding me. Okay. So, this was what I was saying. Okay, so this is a little bit for formalism if you want to play the game in which you basically have to set the minimal mass of a density contrast that you want to collapse related to the, velo to the escape velocity of itself and then compute, given the mass of the object that you want to form, what's the degree of coldness, okay? What's the relativistic index of the particle? But how do we observe the, the, the smallest scales? That's interesting because we actually don't observe them directly. You know what this is? Have any of, has any of you seen this? No. Okay, so this is called the Lehman Alpha Forest. And what happens is that you have a quasar somewhere far away. Okay, so here is your quasar. The quasar, we believe it's a, it's a black hole or something very massive on which the gas is falling. And then it gets heated up and it emits Lehman Alpha stuff. Okay, transition line. So what you see, to, the Lehman alpha is set. The frequency of the Lehman alpha is very well known. Okay, so we will see here, we are sitting here, what we see is the bump of the Lehman alpha shifted in central frequency, right? Because this quasar is, let's say, redshift uh, six. Okay, just to say one, we, uh, we observe further quasars. Okay, so we see something that has is shifted, okay, at a bigger wavelength, and on the top of it, it's extended, right? Because it gets also swamped by, by the redshift, okay? So what we do observe here, the corresponding thing that we do observe here is something here with these being Lehman alpha multiplied by one plus z. Now, I don't remember what the wavelength of the Lehman alpha is. Then, what happens here is that in between the quasar and ourselves, you have small clouds of gas, neutral gas, that are cold gas, that are therefore absorbing stuff at the frequency of the Lehman alpha, right? But then, so this is lambda. But what happens is that these things are at smaller redshift. So the Lehman alpha in our reference frame, the equivalent is smaller, okay? So here, on this side, you will start seeing absorption lines, okay? And that's exactly what you're seeing over there. Now, the thickness of these lines, how many trees you see in the forest, will depend on how many structures there are in here, okay? And how many, they have to be the cold ones, we're not talking about the galaxies, otherwise they would be seeing them as galaxies. So the number of these things that are in there tell, are related observationally to the thickness of that forest, okay? But they're related theoretically to the formation of, to the dn over dm for those of you who manage these formalism. So how many halos, how many density contrasts have survived of a given mass? But this depends on how relativistic is the dark matter. Because toward, so for big masses, so for, uh, this is a function of the mass, okay? So for big masses, we see those objects, we see the clusters, we see the galaxies. But for small masses, we don't see them, okay? And that the small masses, they can be altered by the presence of dark, by the fact that dark matter is either cold or hot, or hot. So since I can model this observable by playing with, I mean, it's, it's dependent on the n over the m, I can actually model what I would see in the Lehman Alpha Forest by using different types, different degrees of uh, relativisticness 
of the dark matter. And this is how the Lehman Alpha Forest will look in different temperatures of the dark matter. So by that, I can set a limit on the coldness or hotness of the dark matter. Again, this plot is really misleading that I'm putting here because it gives you a corresponding mass under the assumption that dark matter is created thermally, which is another point I'm going to come to, and it's not necessarily what happens. In fact, one candidate that you're going to be hearing a lot, probably more than I have in my career, is axons as a dark matter candidate or axon-like particles. Axon-like particles are super light, but they're cold because they basically condensate. Their velocity dispersion is very small. So it's not the mass of the particle that's important, it's their relativistic nature. Okay? Is that clear? Carlos, you wanna say something? Sterile neutrinos? So what I'm trying to point to here is that whenever I, you hear your favorite theorist friend and you, wanna, you want to identify something as the dark matter, it has to comply with all the astrophysical observations that you have, and of which this is just, what I gave you until now is just a, um, a summary. I mean, I didn't go into the details of many things. For instance, here I pointed you to the simplest thing, clusters and disk galaxies, but of course dwarf galaxies are even more compelling for the evidence of dark matter because the gas is completely stripped, you have only a few stars, and they're completely dominated. It's just that the analysis that you have to do for the, for the dwarf galaxies in order to infer the dark matter is basically a burial theorem-like analysis. Actually, you solve the agents equations and you integrate them back. So the evidence is even stronger than these galaxies. I just presented you something which is graspable, but you can expand on, on this, okay? Now, uh, these, I don't like 0.7 and 0.8, actually I had to edit my own list, but this is something that one of the typical short circuit of putting together uh, hypotheses and, uh, and, uh, and facts. But as a matter of fact, again, um, you have, we have now detectors looking for something and it may be interacting weakly, for instance, right? Because it, our astrophysical constraint is that the dark matter doesn't interact with itself below a certain limit, and I can tell you that the limit is sort of the Thomson scattering cross-section for given masses. So what you want to do is to consider all sorts of constraints. We have detectors that are looking for the weak interaction of dark matter particles with the baryons in, in a given detector. Of course, if you're building a model, a naive model that overshoots that constraint, you have to throw it away. Of course, in some cases, people, what they do is they fine-tune their model because they like it so that they go below the, observation, the observability in that detector, which is actually not what you want to do. You want to predict something, okay? But now, given a certain, the, the biggest constraint when you build a model is that you have to comply with the relic density abundance, okay? And that's probably the biggest constraint that you have. The relic density abundance is the abundance of dark matter that can give you the CMB, right? It's the ratio between is this omega matter that causes the peaks in the first place, okay? And when you start with that, then you start going toward interesting things and toward what people call the WIMP miracle, okay? Again, how many of you have heard about the WIMP miracle? Very little, but I mean, don't be shy. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand how I have to put things. Uh, but of those of you who are, those, those of you who have heard about the Wimp Miracle or those of you that have not heard about the Wimp Miracle, how many of you are familiar with the concept of uh, thermal production of something in the early universe? Mm, okay, good. So the reason why there is this conversion, I am going toward the WIMP miracle because I want you to be familiar with what the heck people are talking about when they talk about indirect searches. Not because today I'm trying to propose something specifically or I have a preference for it, but just because I want you to get ready to how to read the plot and to know what people are talking about when they're talking about indirect searches, okay? So that's why I'm going through the WIMP miracle or something of the kind, okay?
so you you know how the CMB forms? The CMB forms? We and we discussed brief or I mentioned briefly the neutrino decoupling, right? The cosmic neutrino background. So at any stage in the life of the thermal universe, you have a lot of species that are or not in equilibrium with themselves. Okay? So you start from a small volume that is very hot. Okay? As the universe expands, the volume will become bigger and the temperature will become smaller. Okay? So an original density rho, it's, uh, we're talking about proper volume, will be redshifted by one plus Z cube. Okay? And at the same time, the temperature will fall. Okay? Typically, the photon temperature will fall like one plus Z at the fourth. Okay? But it doesn't really matter exactly how it falls down. But what happens is that if at any point there are some reactions that are kept in equilibrium, in equilibrium means that I have this side and I have this side, right? Okay? And there is a typical cross section for this process that has a temperature with the, that has a dependence on the temperature. Whenever time is increasing and temperature is decreasing might just work one way in the free universe, in the thermal universe, okay? Or the other way, or not work at all, okay? In fact, weak reactions are a good example, or electromagnetic reactions are a good example, okay? We don't have neither weak reactions nor electromagnetic reactions taking place in the average density of the universe, but of course you can produce them in, a, in the right environment. But what happens is that species are kept at the equilibrium until you can, okay? And at some point, they are told to be frozen out, okay? Is that, is that okay? Good. Now, imagine that you have whatever you like, some sort of particle that is just weakly interacting with, uh, with the standard model through the photons, okay? Photons and weakly. Good. So you have it here. There is a thermal bath, and you have whatever you want. We call it chi. Now, we put protons just for the sake of simplicity, okay? As long as they are kept in the thermal bath, their, their abundance is locked to the one of the standard model, right? Is that clear? Why? Okay, good. The abundance of X. And it turns out, you can prove in cosmology, that for anything thermally locked to the baryons, this abundance is exponentially falling, okay? You have to integrate the Friedman equations, you put balance, you put equilibrium thermally, and you work out, where is that? Okay, wait a second. Okay. No, that's not what I wanted. I'm sorry. Well, it, it goes down with the temperature, okay? So you have something like this. The, look at this solid line here. It's falling down, okay? So whenever it's locked to the baryons and to the temperature, this is for, for cold particles, massive, etc. This is falling down. In a way, if you want, it's because they're locked in the volume and locked in the temperature, and since they're thermally exchanging and the volume is going away and the temperature is going down, their thermal abundance is falling exponentially, okay? But what happens is that because they're talking to the medium, okay, 
But if you, if the chemical, let's call them chemical reaction, they keep them in, in balance with the medium, are frozen, they do not fall the temperature anymore. They're just free. There's just a certain number of particles around. So this plot is actually in commoving volume, so you don't feel the one over Q effect. And whenever they detach from the bath, they save, they are saved, okay? So their abundance will not decrease anymore. It's just cosmological shifting, right? Now, what happens is that the moment at which this will happen will obviously depend on the cross-section at which they're locked, the chemical reaction. Okay, so if you want schematically and then for the equations, I should actually be able to do them a little bit better because I've been teaching this course for two years, but that was two years ago. So if you want the freeze out abundance, we call it, is proportional to the cross section. Okay, to which power? It's inversely, inversely proportional to the cross section, to the cross section that binds them to the, the thermal stuff. We said we wanted to not to talk to the medium, right? The more they talk to the medium, the more they are suppressed. So the, we call this the freeze out abundance when they stop talking to the medium. It's like a relationship. It's toxic. You have, you have a toxic relationship. The more you talk to this person, the more you get depressed. So you want to you wanna break it as soon as possible, right? So how is your cross section? You want to save your mind. How is the, how is the cross section be? Small. Good. <laughs> Guys, I don't know. It's fantastic. It works, OK? So it's inversion <laughs> proportional to. It's the first time that I think about it in that way. It actually works. I'm going to keep it that way. OK, so it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that gives you the idea, all right? But even if it was proportional, what happens is that you really want this thing to freeze out. So there is a dependence on the cross-section. Now, it turns out that if you take the typical weak scale, OK, so masses of the order of GV, Cross-section of the order of the weak scale, which are how many square centimeters, guys? Okay, whatever. If you take this, this scale and you plug it in this mechanism, you obtain the right relic abundance. Now, this scale, the scale of, a, of an extension of a standard model at the weak scale, which flows into SUSY for a supersymmetry, was not thought to solve the dark matter problem. So, when my advisor was young, Susi provided a sort of miracle because he gave you, out of other arguments, he gave you the right relic abundance. Okay? Does it make sense? Now, it turns out, so I'm not arguing that it's good or bad. I'm just arguing that people had a theory built for other reasons that provided something that looked very sexy and very alluring, which was, the right relic abundance. Now, by the way, I am saying that the abundance of, part of, of dark matter particles or stable particles in, the, in this extension were thermally coupled to this medium. So they were going back and forth, and decoupling thermally would actually save the, the abundance. But if this is the weak scale, as I was saying, for other reactions, I can still produce it somewhere else in the universe. It's just not going to be in thermal equilibrium. But if there is enough matter, if there is enough density, and if there are conditions high enough, I can always produce this, right? Because there is a link. That link is the weak interaction, OK? So whenever was the mechanism that produced this, it can still produce somewhere in the universe Okay, either this way, either this way, or if you want to see it with a Feynman diagram, in all the possible ways. <coughs> uh, 
It's not my father. It means that my class is about to be over because I have no one helping me here. I even had to put the necklace myself. <laughs> so the thing, these two arrows, these I don't know what it is, but something of the weak skill. The two arrows, these and these, were the ones that were guaranteeing the thermal production mechanism and giving you the right relic abundance. This arrow is LHC, or whatever collider I have. I throw two baryons together, I produce dark matter. If there is a weak connection between these two, there is also this arrow, maybe, because you can have a scatter of. The cross sections are not going to be the same, OK? Like electron positron annihilation is not a Thomson scattering, but you can work it out from the Lagrangian, OK? Does it make sense? So if you have the theory, you can work out all these elements. Or if you have the, the uh, observational constraints, you can put constraints on the elements of your Lagrangian, given certain assumptions. But the thing is that this mechanism was alluring because, first of all, it gave you a scale. This is the, right, the relic abundance. And this gives you an indication for the cross-section, actually the thermally averaged cross-section, and the mass. There were not exact values, but expectation values for that. Okay, so there was the mechanism, there was a value, and there were ways to look at this thing. One thing is proton, proton, you smash them at LHC. One thing is the scattering, and these are these direct detection. But this arrow is the one that is the object of tomorrow's class, because you will have two dark matter particles smashing into each other and producing this. Now, what's the energy? The energy of this thing is the weak scale. So we said 10 or 100 GeV. If you smash two particles of this and we annihilate it in whatever channel, which is not purely neutrinos, and I think even if it's a pure neutrino, neutrino channel, you might produce some gamma eventually. You're annihilating this stuff and you're producing a high energy shower at the energies of 10 GeV, 100 GeV, 1 TV, okay? It may be gammas. It, depending on the actual coupling that you have, it may be gammas, it may be charged cosmic rays, charged, charged particles, but they're going to be produced. They're going to be produced, we're going to see it tomorrow, where there is a lot of dark matter, right? Because it's depending on the density, because you have two body processes, one with the other. Okay? Does it make sense up to this point? But I want to be extremely clear on the fact that if I don't observe this process, the dark matter scenario still is true because it comes from a completely independent type of proofs, proofs, okay? It just means that either the cross-section is small, either it's a non-thermal process, okay? It can be that there is a non-thermal process of production of the dark matter. It's just a stable particle that is there forever. And it's a decaying particle with a typical lifetime of the lifetime of the universe today or twice. At that point, there should be a sizable fraction of the dark matter decaying today. Or if it is an axion, I'm still coupling the axion with the magnetic field and I might produce a gamma. So there is still a hope to see it with your telescopes that we've been talking about. But please bring home the fact that this process that we're, I'm going to discuss tomorrow is not what characterizes dark matter. It's a possible way to look for a possible candidate of dark matter, okay? That is theoretically well motivated. That's one of the possibilities, okay? And I think my time is over, so I can call my father. <laughs> Should I take my microphone around also? <laughs> so question for Fabio. Hi, Fabio. I was just wondering, I uh, don't know if you know, but uh, how, how can you constrain the possibility of dark matter being small planets or... Being what? Small planets that we can't see. Microlensing typically works. Uh, also dark also Yeah, microlensing. microlensing is very effective on anything that causes microlensing, which is typically... So, no, wait. Planetoids or primordial black holes, something, a compact object, 
Okay, if it's a planetoid, it means it must have formed right now. If it's a primordial black hole that manages to evade the, the so a planetoid, it cannot be because it has to come from gas, and it was gas at the time of the CMB, okay? So microlensing was good up to a certain point, but CMB is really the final stone. Now, if it's a compact object that forms in the local universe, it's killed by the CMB. You cannot do it. There are few things like primordial black holes. Primordial black holes do avoid the CMB constraint for the reason that they were not gas at the time of the CMB. They had already collapsed in primordial black holes, okay? By having already collapsed, the prim they are baryons, but they do not behave like the rest of the baryons, so you can avoid the CMB constraints. And therefore, in principle, primordial black holes can still be dark matter, and you tend to rule them out with different probes. In the mass ranges of sub-Jupiter mass up to one solar masses or five, microlensing kills them. Above them, there's other probes. I, I can give you a review if you want. Pasquale Serpi has also been working on it, like on everything, among other things. Interestingly enough, there was a window that is still open around the mass of the mergers of the black holes seen by, um, by gravitational waves. So in the last few years, there was this burst of activity because people said, oh, we are seeing primordial black holes merging into, that's what gravitational waves. And that's that, it could be the dark matter. So there's been a lot of associations, it's still unclear. The constraints really like get to the border, so they're not constraining it, but it looks very unlikely that it's just behind the corner, but it could be. But for the tight numbers, I'll point you to review. So these are numerical simulations of uh, galaxy formation. And what you're seeing is the same field, but with different filters. So this includes the evolution of dark matter with gas. And you're seeing on the bottom right, I think you're seeing, no, on the top right, you're probably seeing the dark matter density. On the bottom right, you're seeing the radiation field. On the left right, you're seeing the stars. So it's different filters of what you're seeing but the, the material is the same. And you, see, you can see it as it coalesces. By contrast, you have a much bigger volume, which was simulated only in dark matter that looks a little bit like that. So in this case, it, the dark matter is colored, but as you can see, the, the smallest structures collapse first. Okay, this is a redshift 30 or 35. If you look inside it, obviously this is not still, eh? it's evolving, you can see it. And they start collapsing on the top of each other. You see it? Slowly, so look, look at the bunch in the middle. See? They're collapsing and merging, see it? And these two, they will, I think they will eventually collapse and merge. So it's the granularity, the small halos, they collapse into each other and they fall into bigger gravitational potentials. And this is something which eventually is the size of our own Milky Way. And here you make no assumption on what the nature of dark matter is. You're just saying, I put in a fluid which doesn't interact with itself but with gravity and I let this density perturbation that and you, the power spectrum, you take it from the CMB and you make them evolve in a lambda CDM. Of course, the exact details of the simulation will depend from the, on the cosmology, so you have different parameters, so different speed of evolution, but more or less it's <coughs> Planck cosmology with, with W map, more or less. And then it becomes boring. But you feel free to ask me more questions. Um, what is the energy scale that you need to these processes to happen? 
What do you mean where is? I mean, if, if you have a cold gas, it would be very unlikely to, to dark matter particles interact and create a detectable stick now. So to be thermal? It, yes, I mean, if you have two dark matter particles uh -huh. that are very, interact very weakly, if they ever, in, ever interact, they will create a very they, they, small They, they will now. interact, but the, the interaction will be suppressed. Yes. That's why we don't see dark matter in gamma ray. We don't see the, sh the, the sky. I mean, mm -hmm. let's assume that dark matter is this stuff. If the process was not suppressed, you would be shining in whatever they produce. Mm -hmm. Or they would be already consumed, which is not the case. In fact, if you, this is the game that we're going to play tomorrow. We take, we will sit around the scale of this. So the scale of this is set by producing the right relic abundance, okay? So it's the weak scale. That gives you something like this. And say 100 GV. Okay? Then, so this is, say, let's play the game. This is given, okay? Then you take the mass of the galaxy that is mostly dark matter. To make things simpler, take an average profile. So assume it's a sphere of uh, 30 kiloparsec of 10 to the 12 solar masses. You average it, so you know the average density. And you compute the number of events that you should have for this, if you throw in a velocity dispersion, well, you have the velocity dispersion, so it doesn't really matter. You have this average cross-section. You put in this, and how many hits you get per second. So what's the energy release? That's exactly the game that we're going to play uh, in order to do the indirect searches. But if you want to do it today, this afternoon, it'll be very tough. And now that you mentioned this mass scale, uh, how could axions uh, fit into this? Thermal. No, the axons don't fit at all into this. Uh, the mass of the axon-like particles is something sub EV, no? What's um, a milli EV, nano EV? I don't remember, but uh, we're talking about completely different order of magnitude. But again, the problem is not the mass. The problem is that the mechanism production of the axons is entirely different. So they're still cold because their energy would be much smaller than their mass. Nonetheless, the axons would be visible in principle in indirect searches because they couple with the magnetic field and they photoproduce. But then the formula would be completely different, right? So when people typically refer to indirect searches, it's incorrect, but they refer to WIMP indirect searches, okay? You want to say hello to my father? <laughs> we can thank you, or we have to wait for more questions? Well, I only had two. If we stand by the blazer rule, I should get a the third three, The three-question rule also apply to your talk. But you can go. That's fine. <laughs> let's, let's thank Fabio again. <laughs>